Hello, BookTube. Well, this channel recently hit 12.3k subscribers, and I put out a call for questions for Q&A. We've been doing this for years now in, in uh, commemoration of every time we hit any kind of a subscriber number that has zeros in it, and I got tons of great questions, so we're going to go through those today. Uh, with the usual uh, apologies up front, I'm copying all the questions over from the comments field of the video where I requested them to a Google Doc. If in the course of copying I cut off your question or omit your question, uh, then it, it's no offense to you. Feel free to uh, to ask it again. It looks like, at least that I have been told, that we're going to be doing another one of these next week. <laughs> so, so you'll have plenty of opportunity to do that. Uh, so let's see here. We'll start off. We're gonna and also uh, I'm gonna cut these off at 30 minutes per video. Uh, just so that I, the videos aren't going on forever and ever. So we'll see how many we have to do to get through these. Uh, let's see here. Shelf Life says, we all know about the upcoming 20K Q&A, Steve. Don't even say it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. That's insane. Uh, questions. In your many adventures in the last 28 years, have you ever had any encounters with cults? Any crazy stories to tell? Would you consider the career of a cult leader? <laughs> well, aren't I a cult leader already of the weirdest cult in the world? Uh, but yes, I have had encounters with cults, including, and you're going to see this coming, uh, in the last five years in America. Uh, the, the Trump followers now are, have long, long since transitioned from being a political stance to being a cult. And I would argue that that transition happened fairly early. In 2016, many, many, many members of what I would now call a cult were saying that Donald Trump was not human, that he was more than human. And I believe that that is one of the fundamental indices of a cult. If you were to ask a Trumpist today, is Trump completely human or is he a little bit more than human? They would laugh and say, oh, you know, that makes me sound a little crazy. Although, you have to admit, and then they would go on from there because they don't think he's completely human. And that's a, an absolute sine qua non of a cult is that the leader must not be like you. Uh, but also I noticed in 2016, I had a, a vivid demonstration. One of the other indices of a cult is that they require you to deny visible reality. They must decide what your reality is, not your internal spiritual reality, but your observations of the world. Uh, and one of the main things that Trump wanted to do in his first term in office, one of the main things that he was put in office to do was to s cut, slash, or abolish taxes for the extremely wealthy in this country. And he did it in, he did it in such a way that it would hurt people with lower incomes, the, the, lower, the lesser educated, the lower income people that he panderingly said he loved on the campaign trail. The idea that a guy who literally craps on a gold toilet could have won as a, as some sort of populist. It's just, uh, but anyway, uh, at one point in the shakedown from that tax cut, you could see that working classes, working class people's paychecks went up or went down. And in one case, one Trumpist was presented with two of their paychecks. One that said, of their take-home pay, one said 1636, and the other said 1336. And the Trumpist said the 1336 number is higher. You see, my paycheck went up because of what Donald Trump did. What Donald did, they refer to him as Donald, and they consider him part of their present-day family. So they include him in family meetings. They set a chair out for him like Elijah. They believe that he knows what's going on in their lives somehow, mystically, again, because he's more than human. But this person saw those two numbers, pointed at the smaller one and said, see, that's larger. Uh, so, <laughs> that, so, so I would say it completely qualifies, and it's everywhere. It's the biggest cult in the world. So uh, anyway, Zulu Blade says... Uh, uh, just two questions this time. Well, you'll be in the minority, I bet. Uh, number one, can you recommend a good biography of Thomas Chatterton or and or a forensic study of the Rowley poems and maybe offer an opinion as to their metric, their poetic, their poetic merit? I think they're good. I think they're. The, it's a shame that they're not studied. Uh, same thing with the with the Ossian poems. It's a shame they aren't studied just because they were frauds. 
that doesn't seem to make any sense to me. They're still artistic products. And the story behind them is interesting in its own right. But as to a biography of Chatterton, the closest that I have ever come in a way that I enjoyed was Peter Ackroyd's novel, uh, which, of course, gilds the lily. It embroiders things quite a bit. But you, it, it's based, as all of Ackroyd's stuff is, on a lot of research. But an actual biography? If you know, if you can find one that's any good, I, I don't think I've ever read one. Uh, and number two, prompted by the recent Overlook Press reprints, any standout titles from Charles Portis's backlist you particularly recommend? I don't remember if they're rec if they're reprinting this particular volume, but he did a book called uh, Rocket Ship or Escape Velocity, something like that. It was a collection of, of miscellaneous stuff, uh, nonfiction, journalism, uh, shorter works, that sort of thing, that I highly recommend. Um, David Murphy. I was a little odd when the people I'm in contact with elsewhere ask questions on a QA. and uh, I could be in contact elsewhere with all of you. Feel free to voxer me or email me. Uh, but anyway, what does David Murphy have to say? Uh, I haven't asked before, so I thought I'd throw in a few. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, if you could write an introduction for one Penguin classic, what would it be? That would be easy. It would be the familiar colloquies of Erasmus, uh, which were, was, was the best-selling book in the Western world for 30 years and went through a million different editions, which he lovingly expanded on. Everyone had a copy. Everyone used a copy. It, it was, it was uh, Reader's Digest and Bartlett's Familiar Quotations and uh, the Book of Lists all rolled into one. It was a publishing phenomenon. It's never had a Penguin Classic. doesn't have a current acceptable, accessible reprint now by anybody that I know of. <laughs> and you, what what you should do is take one of his later editions, he expanded it as he went along, take one of his later editions, either the Familiar Colloquies or the Adagi, his, his adages. One of those two things, they were, everybody read them, they were common parlance in the reading world, a Penguin classic of either one of those at a thousand pages. So pick a later edition of either one of those it would be great, and I would be happy to write the introduction. Uh, Let's see here. In your travels, uh, is there anywhere you regret going? Oh, yes. <laughs> plenty of places. Plenty of places were dirty and filthy and boiling hot and aggressive and not very friendly to dogs. Uh, basically, <laughs> I, know, I know it would be very unfair to say, in other words, all of sub-Saharan Africa, but, <laughs> but nevertheless. <laughs> uh, let's see. Here. What is the most difficult review you have ever written, whether for personal reasons or simply the nature of the book? Uh, I don't know about most difficult, but they it, they they be they are difficult in both headings. Personal reasons, yes, not so much uh, the the standard idea, the standard wheeze in the in the reviewing world is that you can't review a book by a friend. I don't, I think that's nonsense. Of course you can't. Uh, you, you but you can't. It's much harder to review a book by an enemy because you 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 when you're reviewing a book by a friend, you're using the same yardstick that you use for any other book. And if you're a good critic and a good friend, nothing will change that yardstick. But an enemy, there are the passions, the South Boston Irish Catholic passions get aroused and suddenly it becomes harder. You don't want to use those yardsticks anymore. <laughs> but uh, for, uh, for also for personal reasons, I would say reviewing a book by someone, by a friend who's no longer alive, especially if they were after you for a long time to review one of their books and you didn't do it then to, to finally get around to reviewing one of their books when they can't see it anymore and argue about it anymore. And also on, on just a book on a literary level, uh, I had an example just uh, last year that was tremendously difficult. I don't think I ended up, maybe I ended up reviewing it. I'm not, I'm not up top of my head remembering. It's called The Delivery by Peter Mendelssohn. And I, I talked about it briefly on this channel, but in the whole of the book, is, I won't say ruined, but completely changed by the last page. And talking about what happens on the last page is by anybody's definition dirty pool when it comes to writing a book review. So I, on the one hand, I wanted to talk about it and also warn readers. But on the other hand, I absolutely couldn't. So so I would say, you know, well, there are a whole bunch of them. I don't know that I'd give the plum to just one. Um, Let's see here. One time you remarked, there's a reason why the London Review of Books has never gently tapped upon my chamber door. If you could write a long piece for them, would you like to? Um, well, I would like to, sure, just to see what it would be like. Uh, there's certainly a lot of things that I would want to write at length about. Uh, my, 
my category, my, my criteria, my requirements for writing book reviews, they could not possibly satisfy. They could not, they could only do one of the three, I bet. I need to pick my own subject. I need to be paid and I need to not be edited. Unless I've made a howler, unless there's a typo, but not not you wading into a 2,000-word piece and saying, well, I, I think this isn't really the direction to go in. Well, who cares what you think? It's my review, not yours. I've been doing this 10 times longer than you have. I was doing this for pay long before you were born. <laughs> so you had to be born. You had to squirt out of the birth canal and then learn how to crawl. And then you were sitting up and you were spitting bubbles. All the time that you were doing that, I was writing book reviews for money. <laughs> so, so, so I don't care what you think about what direction my review should take or anything like that. And the London Review would pay and they might let me pick the book. But there's no way that they would run me without it. It's no way whatsoever. So that it's impossible anyway. Instead, I have to take my thrills vicariously by uh, ginning up interest in books that most of my fellow critics might be too lazy or too timid to tackle on their own. There's one in particular about Il Duce that I want everyone to review. I'm what I wouldn't give to write uh, to write 2,000 words about that book. There's 2,000 words to say about it easily. Oh, my. <laughs> but it's never going to happen, so it doesn't matter. I'm, sp I'm, I'm resolutely small fry. Uh, let's see here. A starter kit on of Hollywood memoirs would be wonderful. I love Niven's The Moon is a Balloon and Ustinov's Dear Me. <laughs> yes. And the reason you love those two is because you are very old. <laughs> Uh, and finally, I stumbled on your absent friends pieces, and I think they're wonderful. Oh, thank you. I especially love the one on Sean O'Casey. Well, I'm, I keep meaning to go into the bowels of SteveDonahue.com and fix those pieces. I'm assuming they're all a mess. I, they were all ported over en masse, but I'd, I'd like to go in and fix them, put in pictures, fix broken links, that sort of thing. But I had a great deal of fun. Uh, Let's see here. Psychedelic B says, Hey, Steve, so I've finally gotten around to reading Frank Herbert's Dune books, and so far I've finished Dune, Messiah and, uh, Dune and Dune Messiah. Really loving it, but it made me wonder what your ranking of Frank Herbert's Dune books would be. I believe you've mentioned that The God Emperor of Dune is your favorite. How do you rank the rest? Uh, yeah, God Emperor is my favorite. I am of the, the iconoclastic opinion that the books tend to get better as they go along. Uh, I, I think there's a whole lot more wisdom and uh, narrative efficiency in, for instance, Heretics of Dune, than there is in Children of Dune, even though Children of Dune is is widely seen as the second best Dune book. Uh, I don't, I'm not of the opinion that the books get worse as they go along, like so many people just lazily say, and it bothers me that so many of the people who lazily say that have not read the books and admit it if you push them. They admit, well, I, I tried Heretics of Dune, but I, I could write Cater Tales. Ah, the books get worse as they go along. Well, you can't say both those things. Uh, but anyway, uh, I don't know that I would rank them. Uh, I just urge you to keep reading, definitely. If you haven't been uh, put off by Dune Messiah, then you will probably keep reading. Uh, Joel Swagman says, is the, the is Dumbledore really gay controversy? Or in other words, can authors add in extra details about their characters in interviews and announcements, or do the authors have to put it in the actual books for it to be canonical? Well, you must know where I stand on this subject. Uh, it, of course, it has to be in the books. It has to be clearly in the books in order for it to be in the books. <laughs> you can say anything you want. J.K. Rowling can say anything she wants about Dumbledore, but she's just a reader at that point. So she can have an opinion, and so can I. It's ridiculous for authors to think they still own their characters after the books are written. You had a chance. You had plenty of chances, in every case, to put in anything you want about a character. You didn't do it, so, you know, you're just one other voice in the crowd. Uh, Jane, Jamie McGarry has a barrage of questions. <laughs> You're staying. Congratulations, Steve and Frida. This channel has rapidly become one of my favorite booktube channels. One of? Really? <laughs> Keep up the good work. I have some questions if you don't mind. Number one, what are your views on the work of Ali Smith? I generally like it. Uh, number two, do you like the crime novels of John Connolly? Very much so, yes. Uh, number three, have you ever considered writing a self-published self crime novel under another name? Why self-published? <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's entirely possible. But what kind of ethical person would write anything under another name? Especially someone else's name. <laughs> someone who already exists and has novels. You wouldn't ghostwrite such a thing, would you? <laughs> I think it's all unthinkable. 
in the 21st century. Uh, it would take some sort of old, old school rogue to think that you could joke around with the publishing industry like that. It's absurd. <laughs> uh, number four, I noticed that Calm Tobin's novel, The Magician, was in your worst of 2021. What are your views on the author's other works? I should point out, The Magician wouldn't have been on my worst fiction list if it, uh, if it had been nonfiction. <laughs> but if it had been slightly tweaked to be nonfiction, I would probably have liked it a lot more. But as fiction, it was dead on the table. I tend to like a lot of his other stuff, but this, uh, this no. Uh, five, uh, finally, something I've always been curious about. How much money do you think the mid-list authors in the area of commercial fiction slash crime fiction make from publishing one book a year? For example, the same authors that never get to number one, but their books always reach the middle of the bestseller list. It's not a lot of money. Uh, it's, it's an advance, and then you're earning that back with sales, and it's not a lot. Uh, you really have to have some sort of adjacent gig. You really sort of do. You need to have, a, you know, a wife who's a doctor or a teaching gig at the local community college or something like that. It's it's probably not a lot, enough to live on in the way that most idiot authors like to live. <laughs> so, so it's not a lot of money. Uh, let's see here. Nico Jamarillo says, hey, Steve, always appreciate the Poetry Thursday Sunday, Monday videos keep them coming. I tend to. Uh, do you have a biography of Henry Longfellow that you would recommend? Well, I would recommend the biography by Nicholas Bazbanis, uh, Cross of Snow. And I would also recommend the little chat that I did with him on this channel. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Link Joker says, uh, Steve, since you're rising up the YouTube ranks so quickly, when are you going to take this thing to the next level? <laughs> Uh, rap, boxing, spending $3 million on Pokemon cards. What's your next big career move? <laughs> I don't believe this is going to the next level. <laughs> I know what I would like it to be. It came up in a live stream, and it, it's been on my mind ever since. I know what I would like it to be. I, don't, I, I can't do any of the things that you're suggesting because I don't monetize my videos. And why would I charge you money to talk to me every day? That is, that is just so inherently wrong. Uh, on so many levels, that I would never do it. But there's Patreon. And I, I the other day on the live stream, I thought about that. I thought, what would happen if a thousand of you pledged a dollar a month on Patreon? You wouldn't miss a dollar a month, but cumulatively, it would make a difference for me. In that, I would then, I decided, if, if Patreon, my Patreon is, it, the, those of you who are kind enough to contribute to it, are I bless you so much, but... You mostly ignore it. All of you mostly ignore it. If my Patreon were to be a thousand dollars a month, uh, which is nothing, right? That's that's a tenth of what it could be. If all of you pledged a dollar a month, that's a tenth of what it could be. If it ever, it will never happen. But if it did, I I realized why uh, what I would do with that, how I would up the game here. It came up in a live stream. I would start a separate channel for tech, uh, because I'm not going to talk about tech in any kind of a shill way. So I'm never going to get any uh, review copies, essentially, tech review copies. I'm never going to get anything like that. And not, not like the smooth tech channels that are willing to say anything in order to get that stuff in the mail. And then what? They have to box it up and mail it back. So I'd have to buy tech, which I love to do. But if I had uh, $1,000 a month in Patreon money, I would start a separate channel. It would be a tech channel. And it would be all about... Uh, actually talking to you about the tech, I'm reviewing it. I would love to do that, but that's never going to happen. Uh, let's see here. Number one, thoughts on the... So your first question wasn't a numbered question. You've got more questions. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, number one, thoughts on the historical fiction of Gene Plady. It's wonderful. Uh, number two, is the quality of prose more important in fiction or nonfiction? It's equally important in both. I wish nonfiction writers understood that. Your stack of index cards, the time you log in the Columbia archives, doesn't count for anything. <laughs> it counts for something in the veracity of your work, but it doesn't count for anything as a work of writing. Your your job is still to entertain me, and you don't you that you don't suddenly abrogate that responsibility by a dint of research. Uh, I wish more nonfiction writers understood that the quality of their prose means something at all. Uh, Bass Van Dyke says, uh, number one, what are your thoughts on the new Penguin History of the World by J. M. Roberts? It's good. Uh, number two, I, it's the best one-volume history of the world of all the options that are out there. Uh, number two, I think you have generally expressed that you are in favor of satisfying endings, but can you name a few novels or movies in which an unsatisfying ending worked for you? Uh, well, a couple of movies came up just recently, uh, right? Uh, 
one being Broadcast News, a terrific movie, just absolutely terrific, intelligent movie that has a, a lot of people would consider a very unsatisfying ending because the ending seems to, to suggest I won't spoil it, but the ending seems to suggest that all of the drama that we just spent two hours watching doesn't really mean anything. And along those lines, you could say the same thing about my very favorite movie, The Lion in Winter, which has two hours of the most intense drama you'll ever see in a movie, and then the ending seems to suggest, well, you know, it was just one episode, one bead on a string. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the ending of The Lion in Winter. It is a fantastic ending. I, you know, I hope we never die. <laughs> so do I. Do you think there's any chance of it? <laughs> oh, man, oh, man. But you look at that ending weighed against the rest of the movie, and you think, well, where does this come from? What on earth? So was this anything? Did it mean anything important? And I liked both of those. So it is possible to do. Uh, same thing with uh, 84 Chime Cross Road, obviously. Right. I, obviously, you know, from a purely storytelling point of view, virtually anybody would consider it an unsatisfying way that that ends. And yet, it is satisfying in a way. It works. Uh, let's see here. Nicholas Lassithiotakis says, uh, Yo, Steve, a reprint of Kingsley Amos' selected nonfiction comes out next month from Penguin, in case you want to add it to your Books on Books bookcase. I've been loving Clive James and Anthony Burgess's collections and was wondering what's your favorite volume of this kind. I don't know that I could pick a favorite volume. I don't think I could. On well, most days, probably it would be Burgess. Uh, it'd be, do, do, but do Blondes prefer Gentlemen? It, probably it would be that, just because the pieces are so individually entertaining, regardless of whether or not you know anything about the subject. But there are other days when Evelyn Waugh would be a real strong contender. There's a big, fat collection of those. And Clive James is also... Wonderful. Also, V.S. Pritchett. I, I don't, I don't even Christopher Hitchens. I don't know that I could pick a favorite. I'd probably rotates from day to day. Uh, let's see here. Gerald's Bliss says, thanks, Steve. You read a vast amount and write many reviews on the books that you receive. But how do you decide where to place any given review? I understand that you may be, re you may be commissioned by a specific newspaper to do a review for them. But you also have several venues of your own where you can place whatever you like. Open Letters Review, Big Canoe News, Steve Reed's website, and perhaps others. Well, also my column for uh, the Bedford Times Press in Bedford, Iowa, which is not typically given over to book reviews, but it's mine. I can do what I want with it. So I could review a book or many books for that column. Uh, so what makes you decide to place a review on one platform or another? Would you be at liberty to tell us how many reviews you publish on average per month? Well... It's not a question of, of liberty. It's just a question of knowing. I'm not sure I know how many reviews. Uh, there's there's a great many of them for industry journals, Publishers Weekly and uh, Kirkus. There's a great many for those and a great many for Kirkus. And those aren't signed, so you wouldn't be able to find them anyway. You could you could trowel through the Kirkus reviews and try and figure out which ones are mine. I've had certain certain old friends of mine have said it's pretty easy to tell when it when when one of uh, you know unsigned three hundred word Kirkus review is yours, and I've often asked them, well, you know, Kirkus has a and Publishers Weekly they have a, a formula that the review has to follow. Certain amount of the review has to be recapitulation of the book's contents. Certain amount has to be uh, a review of the book's contents, but that review has to be done in a certain way. It has to be very even handed. It has to be balanced. Kirkus has a name to protect. After all, they can't have reviewers just going off wild. And uh, when I bring that up to people, they, to friends of mine who said, no, it's easy to tell which reviews are yours, they just nod patiently and say, yeah, but the, the, yours are fun to read. <laughs> and that's not true for, for most other, of, of the rest of them. A compliment, but I'm not sure that it's right. Although I've had several friends prove it by picking out unsigned reviews, and, and they're always right. So <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, we had a barrage of questions here. Oh, well, right. What, how do I decide? Uh, well, the paying gigs go first. So if the Globe or the Monitor or the Washington Post, if they, you know, if, if we agree on something, then that comes first. There's an endless number of books that come out every month, and I read a huge number of them, uh, comparatively speaking, nowhere near the total of what comes out, but huge compared to most people in any given month. So there are always going to be books for me to review on, for instance, Open Letters Review. Uh, Big Canoe News, I write a column every month for for those of you who don't know what uh, what uh, Gerald's Bliss is talking about 
I am the book section editor for a print newspaper in northern Georgia called Big Canoe News, uh, Smoke Signals, Big Canoe News in northern Georgia. And we have they, they have a two-page, full-color print section devoted to books, not books on arts, just books. And I'm the editor of that section. Uh, and I have a column every month in that section. Most Usually my column for Big Canoe looks at that month's coming new releases because Big Canoe comes out once a month. Uh, so I look at a few new releases for that month. Uh, and then there's a large number, of, an array of book reviews of new releases in that month. And usually I just let it go at a column. I don't usually review a book. Every once in a while I did. I reviewed the new biography of George V, King George V of England. Because I'm not going to let a Windsor book go without a print review. And it's, you know, I didn't, I didn't manage to interest any other print journals in that. Uh, but Open Letters Review is the biggest draw of the ones that you list here, because it's the inheritor of Open Letters Monthly, which ran for 10 years. It's got a great masthead, including a lot of booktubers you know. It's noticed by the industry, and it's a total free. It's totally free. It, for me, it's free for you, too. It's an online journal that doesn't have a, a, you know, a, a paywall of any kind. But it's free for me in that I can write at any length in any way that I want. There's no hint of editorial interference, which is great. That is great. Uh, to have something that's not a blog, that's an, an actual, you know, journal with a masthead that's noticed by publishers and by the industry, but that isn't hemmed up in any way, is not constricted in any way, that's terrific. It's always very tempting. So what makes me choose? Steve Reads, on my website, oh, stevedonahue.com, I have Steve Reads, which is the inheritor of my literary blog, which ran for 15 years. And Steve Reads is always stuff that's not new. Uh, more like brattle reviews, I guess you could call it. So that that sort of restricts itself. And my column for Big Canoe is usually a, just a, a scattershot overview of some new releases for that month. It's usually not a review of any kind. My column for, a bed, for the Bedford Times Press in Bedford, Iowa, is about bookish subjects. It's not usually a book review. So usually the what the thing is will sort out where it goes, if that makes any sense. Uh, oh, no. All right. Well, we're, we're at 27 minutes, but Olive McQueen has a gigantic barrage of questions, a thousand words, so much for my, my call for brevity. So let's go on to part two. We'll start with Olive in part two.